Can you just use the microphone from the camera? It's not as good, but it's not zero. Oh, it's not that issue. Is it working now? It's a miracle. It's a Christmas. Okay, very good. It's a Cinco de Mayo miracle. Thank you. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, today we're going to start talking about reinforcement learning. So, how many people have been hearing about reinforcement learning recently? Okay. Um, how many people feel like they know what's going on in the reinforcement learning world? I'll put my hand down, maybe. I, 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 my, my take and maybe the, the overall message here is that I think uh, it's awesome, all the things that are happening right now. I think the whole world is a little confused about how well the methods work. Um, I'll give you as much clarity as I can offer. But I think maybe nobody really knows what's happening right now there. There's a, there's a little bit of confusion out there. Uh, but I think there's a lot of, I can give you some of the tools to, to, to be understanding what you're seeing out there and uh, hopefully applying them in your own work. Um, actually, the, this is a bit dated now. It's, a, it's an older book from, um, from Sid Seekless and Bert Seekus, some authors here, but I, I just, I find this so uh, hilarious and so spot on. But there's a book called Neurodynamic Programming. And I'll give, take a moment and read the, the preface. There's a, a subsection from the preface. Sorry, it's wordy. That, well, that, that captures my feelings very, you know, uh, our first impression is that these new methods were ambitious and overly optimistic, lacked firm foundation. Three years later, after a lot of study, we basically think, yes, it's an ambitious ad hoc and lacks firm foundation. But maybe it has a lot of potential and let's see what we can get out of it. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty old book, but I, I would write it the same today. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty good. Okay, so um, what is reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning these days uh, means a couple things to me. Um, you know, I think the, the hallmark of reinforcement learning, maybe a useful working definition here, It's a collection of algorithms for what I would call black box optimization. of stochastic optimal control problems. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit here. So first of all, what do I mean by black box optimization? So. <coughs> The, the, we'll get into the details of it, but the basic idea is if I've got some cost function g of x u over time, I'm going to get access to the values of g and I'm going to assume that I don't have um, f of x, access to f of x and other uh, parts of the system, okay? 
typically assume it's not known. Now there's people that talk about model-based reinforcement learning where you do know the F, but that's pretty close. To, that's just another, like a rebranding of control in some sense. So. Um, some people would lump all of control under model-based reinforcement learning. I'm focusing on the model-free types of reinforcement learning in these lectures. Okay, so um, that's a really interesting, uh, you know, question of how do you, if you, you know, how efficiently can you optimize some complicated cost function if you only get access to the costs and that you don't actually have the, the governing uh, equations. Um, and so this is sort of um, a set of tools sort of, sort of that we can talk about how do you optimize. And that's one of the technical components of reinforcement learning is these methods of optimization, black box optimization, applied to time series problems. And then the other part really is this, you know, the stochastic optimal control, which we've started talking about even in the last few lectures, right? Where instead of just saying, we're gonna do this, we're gonna transition into looking more like we started uh, in the last few lectures at the expected value, for instance, some, some stochastic, you know, we're thinking of these as random variables now and we're gonna have some, some measure of that random variable that, that we're gonna use as our cost. And our, that randomness might come from initial conditions, might come from noise, you know, like the, the disturbance models we talked about in the stochastic dynamics lecture. It could even be that our controller is random, that we might choose to take actions uh, based on a coin flip or something, partly because we don't know the optimal solution yet, and that might be a way to explore our options, okay? So, um, <clears throat> So there's a lot of interesting things to talk about here and what types of cost functions people have been writing down. So maybe you know this part of the uh, reinforcement learning world is about what we optimize. And I guess maybe I could summarize my feelings about reinforcement learning very quickly. I, I'm actually super excited about the work that's been happening in, in the world in terms of this question. I think that um, the activity in reinforcement learning in the last uh, you know handful of years has really pushed the questions that control should be asking into a really rich, much richer domain than they had been asked before. So, um, you know, and partly because they're doing, we're doing black box optimization and we don't have to know the equations of motion. People are applying reinforcement learning to really hard problems where you just, even if you just have a simulation or you just have a physical robot and you might not be able to write down the model. Um, but then they're, they're taking expectations over really interesting, diverse things. So we talked about in the last um, couple lectures, we talked about, you can measure, you can talk about uncertainty distributions as, um, you know, Gaussian uncertainty, I did and then Sadra came in and told you about polytopic uncertainty, right? Uh, you know, the types of reinforcement learning work we're seeing right now is, let's pick a random number of objects. Let's do a random, you know, random number of cars on the road. Let's, let's do random, you know, tire pressure. Let's do random uh, lighting, you know, conditions, all, all things like this, right? That doesn't fit nicely in a polytopic set. Um, and I think that's good. I think that is, sh that is revealing that we've been too conservative in control about the way we've described the variety of things we're gonna experience in the world. And I think we've got, there's a great lesson coming from reinforcement learning about breaking that open and um, you know, asking questions about what happens if the same controller has to work if my robot's gonna pick up uh, you know, coffee mugs and there's a whole bunch of different coffee cups. If you know, it's gonna be different uh, you know, in different people's houses with different types of mugs. That's a really interesting thing that has happened in this world. I'm a little bit more dubious about um, doing black box optimization. I think there, I'm gonna to talk today about a few cases where I think that makes a ton of sense, where I think we really legitimately don't have the models F, and so maybe the best thing you can do, it's totally reasonable to try to do optimization without assuming you know F. But for most of the robots I've touched, you know, 
we have the models. So, so, and these these optimization algorithms are perform much worse than the model-based equivalents in general. So, I want to leave you today with a feeling that you know you should only do this if you really have to. Don't throw away F if you've got it, if you believe it. Even if it's F plus or minus some margins, I think you can do it very well with model-based approaches. And what we should be doing is applying those to the really interesting, richer classes of dynamics, which I think there's gaps in what we can do. Unfortunately, the world of reinforcement learning, I feel, has two very important but different ideas mixed up together. So I don't want to, you know, throw away our better, more structured optimization just because I of, of those tools, but that's sort of if I want to tell you what's happening in the world, that those two sort of come together. Okay. So um, I have a question. Yeah, of course. Why do we not know how this for playing chess or Pac-Man or robots walking around like we love the rules, right? Yeah. Rules. Yeah, totally. Why do you not know So I'm gonna give you a per, uh, an example. Um, and I think so, so for instance, for walking robots, people have traditionally said, taken model-based approaches, where we say we know F and we can write down the equations of motion of our robot. Um, manipulation is an example, which you heard about last lecture. That's an exam example where people have classically been suspicious about the, our ability to model the detailed mechanics of, you know, the, just the contexts are much richer. Uh, the details of a mechanical hand where friction can dominate over, uh, you know, inertial effects and things like this. People have been more skeptical about manipulation transferring, but we're now fighting that down too. I think more and more people are saying simulation-based results in manipulation do scale to the real world. And also, yeah, uh, part of that is if you have to simulate perception and do output, you know, do camera-based feedback control, then the question is can you simulate a camera faithfully enough to get the richness of the real world? People are also starting to say yes. But let me give you a different answer. So here's a case, one of my favorite examples of where um, we do have F, but it's, um, it's maybe not the shortest path to success. And it's a fluid dynamics, okay? So, um, fluid dynamics, we do have F, it's just F is Navier-Stokes, right? And, and it might actually be, it's hard to control Navier-Stokes directly. Um, and there's some simple systems that I think it actually is more natural to do black box optimization and ignoring the complexity, the full complexity of the fluid. And here's my favorite example, which is um, the simplest model of flapping flight. All right, so I got interested in robotic birds, started thinking, what's the, you know, I like the rimless wheel, I like the compass gate. Okay, now I'm looking at a bird. What's the simplest model of flapping flight? Okay, and I found it in, uh, my, my favorite version of it, in, uh, in a set of papers by um, a guy, Jun Zhang, at, at uh, NYU. He had um, something he called the heaving foil. Okay, so um, there's a beautiful set of experiments by Jun Zhang, NYU. So here's the idea. Just like our uh, juggling is suddenly a, ping, a paddle, right? Uh, my beautiful bird flying through the air doing incredible fluid dynamics, I'm gonna reduce that to a symmetric flat plate. <laughs> okay, and I'm gonna pump it up and down. Okay, but it's gonna be free. Uh, I'm gonna actuate it up and down, and then it's free to move horizontally, okay? In the plane. Um, yeah, so. So, um, you know, flapping is equivalent to just pumping it up and down with some maybe some periodic solution, and then flight means I've, I've successfully gone uh, one way or the other. So, what happens if I just standing still and I start taking a flat plate and start pumping it up and down inside a fluid? The air is fine, but maybe it's more dramatic in, a, in water. Um, it turns out that the first thing that happens is if I just start pushing this down, then um, you get vortices coming off the back, 
Okay, the initial at, at, at the beginning, there's actually a pair of vortices that are symmetric also. But yeah, I think people know if you, it, at steady state, if I were to just have this moving at a constant velocity, you would expect a flat plate to actually be shedding periodic vortices. That there's a, a symmetry here that eventually breaks. Okay, so, so you end up getting a von Karman street. So at some point you'll get a, a vortex here, vortex here, vortex here, vortex here. Okay? But the initial onset is what's really interesting because it's, it's actually symmetric at, at first. And if you can think about the forces on this flat plate, um, the water's spinning this way, so it's actually applying some force here and applying some force here. Those are balanced to begin with. But any little asymmetry in the fluid, right, this is an unstable fixed point. So as soon as there's a, you know, something asymmetric about your, your, your boundary conditions or whatever, uh, at some point this will pull just a little bit harder than this, or this will pull a little bit harder or whatever, and you'll get to this setting where you've got just a little bit of horizontal velocity. Now you have a situation that looks more like this. Okay, this one pulls harder, and this one is maybe just pulling a little bit here on the end, and it starts flying. Okay, so the symmetric flat plate, driven only up and down, will actually break symmetry. It could go left or it could go right, but it'll eventually start flying forward. It's pretty beautiful. And at some point, the drag from, from going forward will balance the the propulsive forces from the, the wake and you'll, you'll run out of, you'll, you'll hit a steady state and so it'll, it will not fly infinitely fast. It will at some point, the drag will balance it out and so it reaches a periodic solution of forward flight. Right? That's pretty good, pretty simple model, whatever, flapping flight. But if I were to write down F equals M, you know, X dot equals F of X U, it's really, really hard because now it's, an, it's not even governed by a differential equation. It's a partial differential equation, right? Partial differential equation of the fluid, which is not your Stokes, right? I'm simulating this, plus all the rigid interactions. And, uh, and that's a big, messy thing to try to have to control, okay? Uh, let me show you the, the pictures that June can, comes up with. So this is the experiment. He actually um, made an approximation of this, which it, where it goes around in a circle instead of going. It's, it's more convenient in a lab to go around in a circle than to go straight forever. So it, it's like this. And actually, June is, I think of June as like the MacGyver of fluid dynamics. He, he's at NYU. He like, he'll go into Chinatown and come back with things that look like, uh, you know, he's like a, a pot and whatever. And, and then he uses like relatively inexpensive cameras and he takes pictures that show up like on the cover of science. Uh, it, they're the most beautiful experimental fluid dynamics uh, I, I've seen. Okay, so this is actually, you know, so if you think about how do you do, how do you image a fluid you know, my first step would be, okay, save up and buy like a, a you know, a super expensive 500 nanometer laser or whatever, and you know, and then I gotta pay this much for particles or whatever. June, you know, just flushes the thing around, gets some air bubbles going, uses a cell phone, gets these images that look like this. So here's the flat plate coming by, and you can see beautifully resolved vortex street as it goes by. Okay. I think it goes by one more time. Again, it's just driven vertically and it's free to rotate. And it's flat in flight. Okay, so um, June had done these experiments and then um, we started asking him, okay, if you wanted to now design something, if you wanted to change the shape of your wing or change even the, the way that you were gonna, if you wanted to optimize your stroke in order to maximize propulsive efficiency, kind of like the passive walking story, then how would, you, how would you do that optimization? We've got a bunch of tools from control, how would you do it? And uh, we actually did work with him to do it. Um, we started 
doing things like putting on asymmetric, uh, you know, wings. You could put a, a trailing edge. Uh, but also, we started, you know, examining the problem of designing of trajectory optimization, finding a different periodic waveform that would maximize propulsive efficiency. And the curve, I'll make, I'll ex we'll explain in a minute. But, um, but. How do you solve, given all the tools from the class, we don't really have the tools to address that problem yet um, because I can't write down F, right? So that's a case where we really just don't have F. Uh, in fact, there's a computational group at NYU that did have CFD, and of course you can write a CFD model for this, and at the time uh, of the work, it, it took a long, long time to run that particular CFD model. Computers have gotten faster, codes have gotten better, but still, it's a pretty expensive uh, to simulate this thing. Um, at the time, it took like a day to run uh, 30 seconds of a simulation, and the experiment took approximately 30 seconds to simulate 30 seconds of, of the real system. So it actually was cheaper in this case, if you wanted to do optimization, to just run the physical system than to run the simulation. Right? Okay, so um, how do we think about doing trajectory optimization for this system where we only we don't have access to F, we only have access to our performance, right? So if you think about what you have there, you can put a, a waveform in, and then you can watch what happens. You can measure the forces and the like, so you can evaluate propulsive efficiency. But the goal is to change the trajectory to optimize propulsive efficiency. And I think the right way to think about it is. Um, Imagine you've got a, uh, a mixer. You know these, these mixers that, that audio engineers have, right? Or, or like if you're a, um, a DJ or something, you've got a, a big audio mixer in front of you, right? Imagine that mixer are the parameters of your waveform. And if you were to watch this thing doing, uh, doing some, some stroke form and change the parameters a little bit and see if the score is going up, change the parameters a little bit more, see if it's going down, whatever, and just keep tweaking it until you've, you've found a pretty good setting, that's basically the tools we're going to do today. That's reinforcement learning, right? It's not completely satisfying if I describe it that way, but that's the reality. And you know these curves that you're going to see in reinforcement learning are roughly the uh, uh, that's what happens when the reinforcement learner is is twiddling the parameters and watching the curves, the performance go up. So there was a lot of philosophical, at the time uh, when we first did the, the, the fluid experiments, reinforcement learning wasn't as popular, um, so I had to convince people that it was reasonable to do reinforcement learning, um, and I, I remember I said, often found myself saying, birds don't solve Navier-Stokes. People were like, okay, yeah, I guess that's probably right. Um, at least I don't think they solve Navier-Stokes. Okay, so let's dig into some of the, the specific algorithms. And um, is, that a, is that a sufficient answer to your question? Yeah, okay. I think it's true in other robots too. Um, like if I'm a manipulation system and I'm gonna tie the knots on my shoes. That's like a borderline case for me. Like do I know the equations of motion of my shoes? I could, probably if I, I could approximate them, you know, and, and get a pretty good job, do a pretty good job, maybe it's better to do trial and error. You know, I think there's a lot of cases that are in between. And, and we're, we have to still find out if it makes sense to build approximate models or, uh, I think almost always approximate models will beat black box. Okay, let me um, stay on this side of the board. The most important technical piece that you need to understand to get through the reinforcement learning uh, literature, I think, is uh, what's these days is there's there's a there's a couple classes of reinforcement learning algorithms. We'll talk today mostly about the policy gradient algorithms, okay? And the policy gradient algorithms have this thing that's affectionately known as the policy gradient trick, okay? And it, I think it really came first in an algorithm cleverly called 
reinforce that stands for reward in something like this that some acronym that people there that Williams came up with that spelled out reinforce but the algorithm is called reinforce and uh, um, let me show you the algebra of it and then hopefully make sure you're you're willing to understand we'll spend a lot of the next uh, part of the lecture understanding what that trick is doing okay so we're doing doing black box optimization we're gonna minimize over alpha the expected value of some function g of x okay where X is a random variable drawn from some distribution that depends on my parameters alpha. That's sort of the simplest version of what I'm talking about with the, the, the fluid. I've got some trajectory parameters alpha. I run an experiment. I get a score. I call that score G of X. Every time I change alpha, that changes the resulting you know, trajectory. I get a different score. My goal is to um, is to minimize the expected value of that score. Okay, we're going to do we're going to dig in and make these trajectories and exploit the time um, the temporal coherence of this problem in a minute. But this is the simplest version of it. Is that clear? Okay. So what we'd like to do is to basically do gradient descent, right? I would like to minimize alpha by figuring out what's the gradient of this thing with respect to alpha, okay? So I want to take the gradient of this with respect to alpha, which is the expected value is going to be, if alpha is this continuous variable, is just g of x p alpha of x. Okay. The gradient can come inside the, the derivative, partial derivative can come inside the integral. This doesn't depend on alpha at all, so I can equivalently write this as g of x partial partial alpha the alpha of x. Now here's the trick. When you're in probability land, um, log probabilities rule the day, right? Everything's easier if you get if you use log probabilities. In machine learning, it's a constant theme. I'll, I'll use log probabilities as my uh, objective function because everything's easier and it's still monotonically related to the original probability. Here, it actually is going to come out naturally. So what's the right way to write down this gradient? Well, first, just so you remember that if you have natural log, log of, of u here, then the gradient of this with respect to some other variable is partial u partial x times 1 over u. Okay. That's the gradient. I, I was going to write the u underneath, but okay. Okay, so this means that partial partial alpha of the log p alpha of x is partial partial alpha p alpha of x times 1 over p alpha of x. That's just just the definition of taking a derivative, uh, a, a gradient of the log. Yeah. Here's the trick now. Okay. Multiply this over here, and I'm going to rewrite this as I'm going to write it in terms of the log probability. That's just an identity from over there. 
But it lets me now think of this quantity, which looks like this complicated thing, and think of it like an expected value. Because this is just P of X alpha times some, com com some quantity here. So I can write this whole thing as the expected value of G of X partial alpha log P alpha of X. This is sort of the policy gradient theorem, policy gradient trick. Okay. It's a different way to, it's a, it's a way to compute the gradient. It is a way to compute the gradient. I'll, I, you know, everything I've, I've written here is true. It's not the only way to compute the gradient, I'll, and I'll go into that in some detail here. But um, let's think about how you would actually use this, right? So if I wanted to now estimate the gradient here, I could, for instance, evaluate this you know, experimentally, this expected value, with Monte Carlo evaluations, right? So it's approximately equal to 1 over n times the sum of gx partial partial alpha log d alpha x for um, let's say if I draw x at random from this distribution n times okay and I take the weighted average of that this is an approximation of that expected value with n samples so if I take my um, my flapping foil, I could take, I could lock alpha in, simulate it a bunch of, or, or execute it a bunch of times, come up with the, um, you know, not only the expected cost, but this gives me the update, which would be the direction I should update my gradient, my my parameters alpha. Okay, so that's an actionable thing. Okay, so this is just a nice derivation given I've got random variables flying around of the gradient of the expected value. It's the policy gradient trick. Okay, it's, it's more interesting, more um, surprising maybe, trajectory case. So I don't wanna sit here writing all these things, so this, I'm actually, I put the equations on a slide here. Okay, so now I do exactly the same derivation, but I've got the, my cost is now a sum over, it's a, you know, additive cost, okay? Exactly the same steps here, I've got the sum of g of x, okay, times the, the probability of having x and u. And I can do the same log trick here to think of that as an expected value of the gradient of the log. What's interesting here is if you break into here and think about what is the log of the probability of this over a trajectory. Okay, so the probability of having x at time three and u at time, you know, taking a particular value at time three is the probability of having the initial conditions plus my dynamics telling me how those things are related. Not plus, that it's, it's a product, I'm sorry. And product by the probability of taking each possible u. Which if, it's a, if my policy is parameterized by alpha, right? Then the, I, can, I can have a stochastic policy. So, so I'll have a, a like I said, I'll, I'll have u equals negative kx plus some noise, for instance. And then I could say, what's the probability of, cho of choosing u at any given time conditioned on x? And the total probability of having, of experiencing x, u at time n is just this, summed up only to n. Okay? Log makes everything beautiful. If the log of that turns those products into sums, things simplify out. 
Now when I take the gradient, oh, get rid of that, come on. I forget how to hide that. Can I move that? Uh, what's that? I just, it'll just go away if I wait. Uh, this is just the term up there anyways. Okay, there it goes. All right, so this is what's re what remains. Same algebra we did on the board, but this is now the derivation. Okay. This should surprise you. This says that the probability, according to this derivation, which I, everything is true and correct, it says the, the, the gradient of my performance, depend, which depends on alpha, the expected value of my performance, is computed here by looking at my costs and looking at the gradient in the probability of my controller. But all those other interesting terms about my dynamics and my initial conditions disappeared. This is the big, this is the big trick in policy gradient. They say, and I think it's misleading actually, but um, they say, look, the policy gradient only depends on the randomness in your controller, not on the dynamics of your plant. What does that mean, right? How can that possibly be true? The dynamics show up in the X that comes with the cost. Certainly the values that, that this takes uh, depend on that, but so, yes, so, so the rollouts do, but I don't have, have to know my plant dynamics in order to make the update. It's enough to experience it through G. Okay? That's the derivation. It is true, it is good. But um, what I want to make sure you understand is that this is not, so people say this is the policy gradient, and it's, uh, but this is not the only derivation of the policy gradient. And in fact, um, there are, you know, the fact that these, these things are true in expected value is actually a fairly weak statement. And I'll show you, I want to, as I dig into the, the sort of the black box optimization a little bit more, what I want you to realize is that actually I could take all this beautiful math and replace it with something that just twiddles the parameters on the, on the mixer and has almost no, it doesn't even have to look at this at all. And it'll also be true in expected value that we can go downhill. So it's kind of like, remember how we said the RRT is probabilistically complete? And yeah, it is. It's, you know, it eventually fell all state space. And also the thing that just picks random actions and all, at random times is also probabilistically complete. It's a fairly weak statement. And this derivation that is guarded by this, just the fact that the, these quantities are true in expected value is a pretty weak statement, okay? And it is true for this statement of the, of the log probabilities of the policy, and we'll see why and see how it works. Um, but it's also true for simpler updates, and it's true for updates that do involve the dynamics of the plant. The difference between all these different updates is that this update, or you know, the, the completely naive one, which doesn't even use the, the parameters of my policy, has a very high variance. The expected value is, is correct, but it has a very high variance. So it would take me many, many samples of Monte Carlo to have a reasonable estimate of that expected value. This one is somewhere in between. It's, uh, it still has a high variance. It takes me many samples to, to do it. It, but it leverages what I do know about my about my system, which is the gradients of the controller, and ignores the parts I maybe don't know about my system, the, the F. So it's it's a good update in that sense. It's a sweet spot. But if you think about the full-on stochastic optimal control we did, we started talking about a few lectures ago, um, you can get an even lower variance estimate of the expected value that does take into account the plant dynamics. Okay. So this is the, the core sort of theorem of policy gradient. And uh, you know, I want you to be able to see where it comes from, also appreciate its limitations. Um, <clears throat> the idea here is, I think, pretty clear, though. So um, you know, the intuition I'm going to take n random trajectories. 
let's say they all start from some small set of initial conditions, they're going to roll out based on the random uh, forward dynamics, but also the randomness in my controller. Okay, so this is on each of these, I have a sum of g of x u going here. Maybe this is uh, roll out one. All right. Okay, for each of these, I get to experience the cost. Some of these, the cost is high. Some of these, the cost is low. What, I, the, what this update is saying is that you should increase the probability of the actions that you took on the paths that were, that were low cost or high reward. That's the basic intuition. On each of these, I'm going to I'm going to roll my die. I'm going to take slightly different control actions. Control actions. Sometimes my cost was high. Sometimes my cost was low. Whenever when I get a low one, I should increase. I should make that more likely. Right? I've taken. I have a, a policy that is let's say u equals negative kx plus some random number. Be a simplest policy. Okay, I'm gonna as I roll out my my trajectories with different random numbers coming out of my policy. I say, oh, I got a good one. How do I make it so it's more likely that I'm gonna change k so that the control I got from w having that particular value is more likely in the future? That's the intuition you should have here. That's why. That's what this sort of derivation says: is that what matters is the probability of pulling u given the x, and I'm going to weight it by the cost that I'm getting. There's a subtle dependency on the summations here, where this is smart enough to realize that the cost at time three, for instance, can only be influenced by u from time zero to, to three, and it won't try to update you know, u12 in order because I got a good cost, a good score at u3. So the summations are all clever and good, but it's the idea is just very, very simple. So basically, if the cost is high, it's changing. If the cost is high, um, change what you're doing. If the cost is low, uh, make it more likely to happen. Yeah. Okay, so um, the only problem with it is that it's it's a very inefficient update. It takes many uh, many many Monte Carlo rollouts in order to make a good approximation. I could get a um, you know it could be that if I just rolled out once, then I have you know basically no signal. If I roll out a handful of times, it, 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 because this expected value has high variance, um, it's inefficient. But it works, and it works. You know whether you have a, a simple spline parameterization of your trajectory or a full deep neural network that you're trying to tune, you can use the same update. Okay. All right. So that's the trick. Let's dig in a little bit and see, um, you know, how that plays out in stochastic optimization. Let's take out the randomness for a second and just have a, a simple, um, simple problem. I'm going to directly put alpha into here, and I have some cost function g that is uh, directly dependent on alpha. 
So we said we're allowed to evaluate, to know the values of G. The only thing we weren't allowed to get directly because we didn't have F was the gradients of G. So what you can think about for these black box optimization problems is how do I minimize G of alpha if I don't have access to anything except the value of G, not the, not the gradients, right? What's that? No, that's good. What's what's your instinct? I mean, what what tools would you start pulling out to try to if you wanted to optimize this and you didn't have a gradient, couldn't compute G directly? I mean, the first I think the first thing I would think of is that I could approximate the gradient with finite differences. Right? So I could evaluate G a bunch of times. So partial G, partial alpha, evaluate at some alpha, is approximately equal to, if I could evaluate G a bunch of different times, alpha plus, let me call it epsilon I, this would be the 0, 0, 0, epsilon 0, 0 at the ith element, minus G alpha over epsilon. Right, so I could take and evaluate G if I if alpha is n an n-dimensional vector. Then I could I can estimate the gradient here by evaluating G n plus one times. I evaluate it once for alpha, and then I go through each of the, I perturb it in each direction and make those updates. And that gives me an estimate of the gradient. And then I could go ahead and use this and do um, then gradient descent. You can also do higher order methods. You can try to estimate the Jacobian or whatever. Okay, so this is our straw man. This is what people might do in a numerical uh, environment where you could just simulate a bunch of times. Um, but what happens if G is very expensive to evaluate? Okay, what happens if um, you can't afford to take n plus one evaluations for every gradient update? Or what happens if another case we'll consider in a minute here is what happens if G is, uh, is, has some randomness to it so that you can't actually get a clean gradient by evaluating. For instance, my robot, maybe I can't set it down in exactly, the, I mean, this would be sort of equivalent to running an experiment where you set the robot down like this and you execute, and then you have to set the robot back, back down in exactly the same initial conditions, perturb your controller by a little bit, and then execute. Maybe you don't have the luxury of, of getting perfectly deterministic evaluations of this, so you can't do that. There's a number of reasons why this might fail. But the first one is that it's already expensive in terms of evaluations. If my goal is just to get to the minimum, and my objective is to do that with the least number of evaluations of G, then finite differences might not be the best choice. Okay, so how can you do better? In general, there are tricks from stochastic gradient descent. That will let you do better. Even if G is deterministic, but it's just expensive. Right? So, the idea is as long as I'm going downhill, 
get away with less <laughs> evaluations. Also, sometimes it's actually better to be stochastic. I mean, straight on gradient descent goes downhill efficiently, but it can also get stuck in local minima. Some people justify using stochastic gradient descent because it might actually, by virtue of it being a little noisy going downhill, it might actually hop out of local minima and keep going. So a lot of people, um, you know, stochastic gradient descent has been one of the big themes, certainly in the um, in the modern deep learning push. Um, but it's it's an old idea that that has a lot of nice motivations. All right, so here's a different idea. I call it weight perturbation. People call it different things. I got this from my advisor. The name weight perturbation. Um, so consider the following update. What if the change I'm going to make to alpha is just like this? What if instead of perturbing the parameters in every single dimension a little bit, and waiting until I've accumulated those all to estimate the gradient and then taking one step. What if I just take my parameters, perturb them in one direction? This is kind of the mixer idea I was saying, right? I'll just change them a little bit, see what happened. I'll compare the slightly perturbed parameters with the original parameters. And then I basically, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I propose that this is a, the sim, maybe one of the simplest laws that will actually accomplish going downhill. Okay? So, you know, I'm going to evaluate it twice now. If this is bigger than this, then this is going to basically make B go, um, I'm going to move in the direction of minus B. So if I, if my cost went up, if this is bigger than this, then it's going to change my parameters in the opposite direction of my experiment. But if my cost got lower, it's going to move me in the direction of, of beta. Is that clear enough to see? Okay. Change, change my parameters by a little bit. If it worked well, I'm going to make a more permanent change to alpha in the direction of beta. If it, my experiment got worse, I'm going to move in the opposite direction. One line, simple, two evaluations. And what you can show is that that is going to perform stochastic gradient descent. That the expected value of this update is actually, if you do the derivation, which I've got, I think, nicely in the notes, is actually um, in the direction of the true gradient. Where this is, where. is our Gaussian random variable, then on average, this thing actually goes downhill in the direction of the true gradient. And the picture you should have in your head is stochastic gradient descent. It looks something like this. If I'm doing the minimization of a quadratic function, I start at some random value. This is in two dimensions, not so interesting. I pick a random direction. If it was good, I keep it, and that'll do a random walk down my down my bowl, down to the minimum. It'll bounce around. It'll never strictly converge unless I turn eta down. Okay, but it will eventually get down to the minimum, and uh, you know, with some care, like turning the learning rate down to zero, eventually it'll converge to the to the minimum, to a local minimum. Okay, trivial update two evaluations instead of n evaluations. If you compare how quickly, in terms of total number of evaluations, this does compared to this, 
this actually often wins. The analysis to, to allow you to see that depends on some more, it, t it depends on some assumptions about the, you know, the, the smoothness of this and, um, and the like, but, but if your goal is to do less evaluations, this wins. Okay, so that's a cool idea. I like that idea a lot. Um, the problem is, again, this is a very noisy estimate. So um, you could, you could still, you'd still like to eventually do better. Um, okay, one more problem here is this still makes the assumption that I can compare two very similar simulations. So if I had a real robot and a noisy evaluations of G, then doing this comparison might not be possible. So it's interesting to ask actually, can I just, can I do this with this, just one evaluation and still get stochastic gradient descent, okay? It turns out there's an even simpler version. Instead of having this be the perfect evaluation of alpha, if I replace this with some constant, which is just my guess, my rough estimate of what I think uh, G alpha would be, is one way to think about it, then I get the following update, where this is some baseline, maybe expected performance. One way to get that is sort of as a you know a history of previous experiments. I might have some sense of what what a, what my baseline should be. Okay, and I'm just going to take g of alpha plus beta, compare it only to my baseline, multiply by by b. It's almost the same update, but now it's not dependent on comparing two perfectly similar signals. This one still has the property. Is proportional to uh, negative g partial alpha. This is still doing gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent. In fact, what's really crazy is even if b equals zero, I just ignore this term and just write this update. Even that will do stochastic gradient descent. And the picture you should have in your head for that is I'm going to get some cost G, 1,268, right? And I'm going to multiply it by beta. But on average, if I do this enough times, the expected value here, the, the scores that have a higher cost, I will move in beta's direction more often than the ones that have a lower cost. So in net, this update, although it's potentially horribly inefficient, going up and down all over the place, on average, it is actually still going downhill in terms of, in, in the direction of the true gradient. Okay. So I mean that to be both a little bit cool, um, that, it's, that it's such a simple algorithm can give you something that seems like a strong property, but I also want this to be a little bit of a reminder that when we put up the policy gradient theorems and when you know papers talk about this amazing property that the true gradient, you know, that the policy gradient only depends on the policy parameters. This is one of a family of updates that you could do to your parameters, which could even, of which this is another example of the family, where you literally just twiddled your parameters, completely ignored, ignored any structure in your controller whatsoever, looked at the total cost and made an update. That has the same property, that this is also going downhill on, on average. So it's kind of a weak property to have. It's an important, I mean, you would, you would like to have at least this property, but it's not enough to say, I've solved the world, okay? 
and in practice, um, it's a sort of can take a lot of time. The downfall of reinforcement learning today is the sample complexity, right? Meaning that it takes lots of, how many times do you have to evaluate G in order to, um, in order to optimize my, to, to find a good value of my controller? How many times does your robot have to fall down? If you pick it up, try it parameters, pick it up, try it parameters. How many experiments do you have to run in order to, to get a good controller out? And right now the sample complexity is, is often prohibitive. Massive computational resources have changed that game a little bit, but it's still hard to know, um, you know, how well this works. Okay, so um, if it's helpful, there's there's also a connection here between what this is and the policy gradient trick. If you think about, um, yeah, I, I, maybe I won't dwell on it, but. There's, a, there's a, only one or two more steps required to basically see this as exactly a reinforced algorithm. Um, but the main message I want you to get across is that there's a, the, the property of going downhill at the expected value is an important but not a uh, totally magical property. Okay, so how does it play out in practice for the, um, for the heaving foil, just as a specific, to give you one grounded example. We tried to, to parameterize the stroke waveform. This was time um, over a fixed period T. And we literally had a parametric waveform where the parameters where, for instance, you know, alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and we fit a spline coefficient to these parameters, okay? One of the simplest parameterizations you might expect. Um, but it was actually a very good parameterization, justified with a lot of work. <laughs> Uh, over many many of the alternatives, okay? So we thought, for instance, that, um, that for instance, writing the Fourier coefficients would be a good idea. It's, we're, we're looking for a periodic function. Of course, we should use a Fourier basis to parameterize our, our periodic function. Um, but it turns out the parameterization like this was performed much better in learning than the Fourier basis. And there's sort of a very subtle reason why that is, but the, the efficiency of these updates, of these approximate updates by changing parameters, they are more efficient if you have a parameterization where all of your parameters contribute approximately equal to the, equally to the gradient. So one of the problems with the Fourier basis is that your first component has a huge effect on your, on your total stroke, for instance, and the higher order terms have increasingly diminishing total effect, let's say, on my waveform, or the way it came across in the, in the cost. So in practice, if in a Fourier basis, if I twiddled parameter 32, then I saw very little change in my cost. If I twiddled parameter zero, you know, in either direction, I'd have a massive change in my cost. This made the number of samples required in order to estimate that gradient extremely high. 
This parameterization, alternatively, if I make a small change to any of one of these parameters individually, then I could, I could, you know, independently sort of distinguish what are the features of that parameterization on the total control. Right, so somehow this no, this notion of having a good parameterization uh, it matters a lot in terms of, of the performance of these algorithms. In practice, um, it was pretty satisfying. So the cost function was the total cost of transport. It was actually the in it was maximizing the inverse. And, um, you know, fairly satisfying, but uh, from lots of range of initial conditions, you, you take your symmetric flat plate and you optimize it over and over again, it would converge to a basically a perfectly, uh, almost a perfect triangle waveform. Um, post hoc, we had a perfectly reasonable fluid dynamics justification for that. So you're basically trying to maximize your vertical displacement uh, by, while minimizing your total um, your, your total v squared drag. So it sort of after the fact, uh, Jun Zhang was was like, oh yeah, of course that that is uh, of course that's what it should be. But it was very satisfying to be able to put this thing into the tank in Chinatown and flap it for a few minutes in about in the, like after 10 minutes or so, you would we'd basically converge to an optimal solution and find our optimal flapping flight in something that we it would take a day to simulate 30 seconds, but in 10 minutes we could converge on the optimal solution. So, you know, this situation worked very well. The, um, you know, partly because it had very repeatable experiments. In fact, I think that um, control has done this type of thing for a long time. There, it's often called extremum seeking control. Extremum seeking control. Um, iterative learning control is another name for it. Or a related set of ideas. None of those sound nearly as cool as reinforcement learning. So that was a, a bad choice, I guess. But um, but a lot of the core ideas that you see in reinforcement learning were also explored um, in a, in, with a different style in, in that literature. And there's a lot of, I think, still more to, um, to find out. And I think, in general, these things work, extre work extremely well if you have repeatable experiments, which means that your, um, you know, your ability to, to run repeated experiments and get a relatively good baseline and do comparisons across means that you can, you can optimize these very effectively. As the diversity of tasks goes up and the complexity of the problem goes up, it's harder to know how well these, these the systems are going to work. Okay. So what we're seeing today is this, you know, this burst of activity in reinforcement learning. Um, oh, by the way, I, I grabbed this excerpt from. Then why I, I belabored this ben. dumb double integrator? Okay, so this is a simple problem. This is Ben. Oh, the simplest thing we got to be able to do. The recent and I decided to run so policy grading on this, and I did this on my blog, and it turned out the first time I ran it, it was completely. I'll, I'll talk for Ben, but he does. He does. Uh, he was looking at the efficiency of policy gradient for doing LQR of the quad rotor balancing, a problem we're familiar with, and he says it works really well. But it took. Well, actually, he, here he's ranting about how the, it doesn't actually work very well until he said I wrote a blog post that said it didn't work, and then somebody corrected me, and, and I made some subtle changes to my policy gradient algorithm, and then it finally worked. And that actually you can't use policy gradient out of the box. You have to do, uh, you know, you have to make these sort of annoyingly small changes. But what he's really, you know, that what that plot shows is this example of LQR. He says it takes about 30,000 
trials to converge on the LQR solution for the quadrotor, and the flat line is, you know, you just called LQR and MATLAB or whatever, and, and you got your controller immediately. So that seems like an example where you shouldn't use reinforcement learning. And it's interesting to compare sort of, uh, you know, compare these systems to the known results. It's not done very often, but Ben has been sort of trying to be vocal in the world about saying we should do those comparisons, and oftentimes reinforcement learning doesn't look very well, uh, very good compared to the sort of the model-based alternatives. His next statement is sort of similarly uh, aggressive, saying that, like, I think, what does this next slide say? But it says basically, like, yes, extraordinary claims are extraordinary evidence, right? Um, there's also examples like this, okay? This is the OpenAI hand that, um, you know, the, the news outlets are saying dexterous manipulation is solved. Meh, I don't know. It's hard to, so the task here is to be able to put the letter in the orientation that you see down here. And it's a complicated mechanical system with contact and everything like that. And this is the policy that they generated. I don't, I don't really know what to make of it. Um, I'm not dazzled by its mechanical performance, but, um, and the ta you know, I don't know what the twiddle my fingers randomly policy would look like. Um, but I think it's, I do, so I, that sounded more sarcastic than I meant, but uh, uh, I do think it's awesome that people are taking, you know, these hard problems and throwing, saying, you know, if we're willing to throw computational resources at it, this is a pool of 384 worker machines, each with 16 CPU cores. Um, they're simulating approximately two years of twiddling the fingers per hour, and it takes something like 50 hours of training. So uh, twiddling your fingers effectively for 100 years to learn how to do this. Um, so I, I am excited about the ambitions that people have, you know, and, and the, the root compute and other things that, the, you know, we can really open some doors for us. But I think we got to get that number down if it's going to be useful. Okay. This to me still is not really a controls task. There are, of course, interesting dynamics there. Um, but, you know, we are starting to see more and more controls -y tasks. I think the most impressive one to me is um, from, you know, from our world of, we've been talking a lot about walking robots here. This is from ETH, Marco Hutter's group. They learned a policy using policy gradient optimization in simulation that could do things like this. So yeah, none of the motions presented here are handcrafted. They're all learned from simulation, including the, the turning, the fast trotting, the recovery. They use lots of simulation, but it's pretty awesome. I mean, it's pretty awesome to have relatively naive policy optimization. I mean, their paper was mostly talking about the work they did to do system identification to make the simulation sufficiently accurate. They used even deep learning models for uh, for getting the actuator dynamics right, the friction dynamics, even the subtleties of their controller. Di you know, they say, I've got a control box here. It's got dynamics that we were missing out on that was preventing our simulation-based results to transfer to reality. So they did a lot of work to do the model Modeling in there, and then it was kind of like, yeah, we took, you know, we did a trust region policy optimization, but it could have been any of these policy gradient algorithms. We ran it a bunch, boatload of times in simulation, and we got controllers that worked on the real robot. Right? It's pretty awesome. So there's more and more of these coming out. Um, so. I guess there's there's sort of a philosophical question about how well they um, how well they really work. Have we solved any problems? Right. I divisively put this at the end of the lectures 
because I was afraid everybody would do their projects on them and then would run out of compute before the final projects were due, you know. Um, so sorry for waiting till the, till the end to talk about reinforcement learning, but um, you know, it's hard. I think people really want these to succeed. Everybody's really excited about reinforcement learning, but um, I think we have to get those numbers down for them to be useful. And, and I wouldn't probably put it on a self-drive. Some people talk about putting it on a self-driving car, right? But it, do I really think the policies that are coming out of that are going to be, are they certified in any way that I would trust myself to ride in the car? So, a thought experiment. So if I were to take a deep neural network to represent my policy, and we're just to set those weight, the weights of my network to random values, run a simulation, set it to a different random, random values, run a simulation, different. And I just did that long enough, and I took my favorite weights, and I showed them to you, and showed you a video of a robot doing something like this. That's an algorithm that would work if I had enough compute power and enough patience. I could, you know, assuming there's a representational power in the neural network, which I think we, we've demonstrated there is, then if I did that long enough, it's kind of the monkeys on the typewriter sort of idea, um, then I could eventually make videos that look pretty impressive. I don't mean to point to Animal. I think that Animal is actually a really good example here. But, um, but I don't know. I think the whole world is confused. I'm certain. May I speak for myself? I'm confused about whether we've actually succeeded in something, whether we've pushed the field forward with that. Because these algorithms are only a little bit more than that. And they are solving hard problems, but they take a lot of, of compute and a lot of restarting and a lot of random search. Um, so I think there's more work left to do. What do you guys think? Yeah. So it seems to me that it's a little contradictory in the sense that uh, all the videos you have shown where uh, reinforcement learning had success, like the OpenAI and the animal robot, are all cases in which we have great models. And it seems that these tools are strong when we don't have models. And uh, it seems that people are pushing in areas where we should do something else from what they get out of this way. So I... I think the reason for that, so the question, if you've already heard that, so why, why are the examples we're seeing here places where people do have models and then they're still doing reinforcement learning when we probably could be doing something else? Um, I, there are a couple other examples, you know, admittedly, where, where um, people are tying ropes, tying knots and ropes and stuff, which I think are, are farther along the, we, we might not have models, but, or pouring, you know, things like this. Um, there's, a, there's a question of whether we have a nominal model. There's also a question of whether we have done the engineering work to pull the gradients all the way through the model. A lot of people start here with a black box simulator that doesn't give gradients, for instance, doesn't give any more structured and you know sparsity in the optimization uh, and things like that. So you can apply these algorithms to any simulation box, Grand Theft Auto or you know whatever. And so I think that's a reason why people are using maybe the black box algorithms, even though if you were to dig into Grand Theft Auto and you could pull out the gradients with, with extra work. And to some extent, that's why I put a lot of work into Drake is because uh, most of the simulators that can simulate the complex things don't actually make all the gradients available. And I wanted the gradients. I think it's a longer path um, to do the model-based thing, but once you have it, I think you can optimize much faster. Yeah, I think there's a. I think there's always a good justification to be able to change to you know to adapt to new situations. If your model changes, even if your it's your walking robot's actuator gets you know starts slipping or whatever, to be able to have online adaptation, awesome, totally good. And then I think the big question then still becomes, do you, do you start with models that you sort of know and, and try to work with those models? Uh, maybe it's radial basis functions on top of a nominal physics model and you tune the, the models or do you try to do direct tuning in the policy parameters? And that's the philosophical difference. And I think both are good and both, you know, I think there's something in the middle.
Yeah, so these are fairly explicit techniques and implementation. Um, how like related to this would be, um, say, using like a convolutional neural, neural net to implement this? These are the updates. If alpha is the parameters of my neural network, you'd still people still do this update, these updates on the neural network. It's really, I mean, okay, there there are, there are a handful of algorithms that have emerged as the most popular. There's a trust region policy optimization. There's PPO. There's a, there's a handful. They are all based on this basic core idea. Some of them do things like the trust region idea is that you guard yourself so you don't make a stupidly large update. So you bound the, the, the total update that you're willing to make, but otherwise you move in the direction of the gradient. There's all, there's, there's, you know, there's minor changes in how you do this. The fundamental theorem is the same, that you're trying to, to estimate the policy gradient and go downhill. Uh, and people have applied that with success on deep networks. Yeah. That's the value there. It's a function g of x times the derivative of log p of x. Yep. So I wonder, do you guys have ever thought of using the important sampling techniques to like sample those uh, paths of our just to make that computation? Absolutely, yeah. So there, are, there is important sampling policy optimization. Uh, it's a, it's a really good idea and a really good thing. It's um, somehow there's been maybe a, a regret. Like some of these tools don't use that. Uh, you, you would think that that would be a winning idea right away. Um, the, the more naive algorithms still do the do the job if you put enough compute behind it, and those are the ones that are in favor right now. But important sampling is a theme. It's definitely a theme in the last 15 years of reinforcement learning work. Okay, so there's another half of reinforcement learning which tries to estimate the value function, the cost to go function, as it goes. And I'll give you some examples of that too, and there's Q learning and other things. I will do that uh, on Thursday. See you then.